On the technology, I'll begin. Okay, it's green leaves. The sun's coming with me. Okay, we're all good, we're all good. So, Bolo Da, Kappa Lady, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, this is actually, and I don't know if anyone's picked up on this, my first time um, being given a whole talk in Kappa Lady. I was given half a talk once, um, and then I did a few online, but this is the first time that I'm actually doing kind of a live talk, um, and it's really nice of the leadership team to think that they would hire out such a huge venue um, for my talk. That's very lovely. Um, but I'm really excited to be talking and also a little bit nervous just because um, I feel like this series has been such a strong series. Um, I don't know if you've felt that as well. Um, I feel like everyone has brought really good challenge and their understanding of the story of Exodus is just getting so strong. Um, so I'm going to give a little recap of what's been said and what's been going on because I'm going to be talking about kind of one single verse today and I think it's really important that when we're talking about verses that we kind of see what it is that's led up to that moment um, before. So Rachel kicked off this series um, in this very room talking about God's promise um, and the importance of remembering and trusting in God. Um, talking about that period from the crossing, the parting of the Red Sea um, and going uh, journeying to the bottom of uh, Mount Sinai um, and how the Israelites started to, even though they've had this massive miracle just happen, they start to moan and whinge because they're hungry and God provides all of the time for them um, but they start to moan still and criticise Moses and God. And then if you haven't... Um, caught up with some of the series, her, the next talk, The Theology of Suffering, um, really, really strong, um, really important that we get that theology right. Um, and then we went on to the foot of Mount Sinai where God invites the whole nation into a covenant relationship with him. And then we had John Sadler, he did a great talk um, on the Ten Commandments um, and just how important it is for us to have that standard of living that um, God gives us some clear instructions on how the best way we can live our lives is. And then John Rippin, the Tabernacle Talk, and that, uh, that raising of the spiritual temperature in our community. Just such amazing words. Um, just really enjoying the series, basically. And then Rachel again, that call to holiness, living a holy, nice, holy life, and what that looks like. And then last week we had Karen. Um, talking about when Moses goes up Mount Sinai and um, the Israelites get, um, yeah, they decide to make a golden calf and worship that instead, even though that blatantly is breaking the first two commandments. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where we are. That's what the, the story has led up to. And we're in uh, verse 34 now. Um, and the main kind of crux of what I'm going to be speaking on today um, is verse 6. And then I think John Sadler is next week talking on verse 7. Um, so where we're at, so after the Israelites break the covenant, God invites Moses in his, into his anger and his pain. He's venting his feelings, uh, saying he wants to wipe out the entire nation of Israel. So Moses intercedes, appealing to God's character, saying that this would mean going back on his promise to Abraham and ruin his reputation among the nations. So while uh, God brings justice to those who instigated the idolatry, um, he forgives the nation as a whole. So at this point then, um, God describes himself to Moses. I don't know if we've got the, the slide, my one slide on the screen. Um, and he says, he says this. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in his love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So in other words, God is full of mercy and must deal with evil if he claims to be good. So above all else, God is faithful to his promises, even it means committing to himself, uh, to people who are faithless. 
So I'm going to be kind of going through all of these words and giving it just a little bit on that. Um, but what I want to say before I start is that the, the idea of the character of God and who God is is not something that can be covered in one talk. This is something that all of us will be exploring for our whole lives because there's so much goodness, there's so much more to God than we can ever comprehend. So I think this is um, a good... Well, I think it's good. A uh, little starting point, um, but I honestly just urge you to explore this, go deeper and deeper into God's character, because that's where some real strong, uh, good stuff comes out of, because he's an amazing, amazing God. So we've got uh, the first word he describes himself is compassionate. Um, and in Hebrew, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I watched a video, um, and it told me that in Hebrew, the word from, for um, compassionate is rachum. And this is linked to the Hebrew word for womb, so a lady's womb. Um, and we are invited into the image um, of a woman's tender feeling for a vulnerable infant. So this also can be dis uh, translated as deeply moved. So it's a really emotional wor word, this word uh, compassion or rachum. Um, so he's caring for the Israelites as his own children, but they reject his compassion and they turn away from him. Instead of being compassionate like him, uh, they're violent and they rebel. So God is full of motherly compassion um, and will rescue his people. And the way that he does this, we see this later on in the Bible, is coming um, into the world uh, through Jesus, entering into the suffering of humanity. Uh, Jesus, in his deep com uh, compassion, uh, made human. And he embraces everything uh, that a compassionate person would embrace. So um, we see in his life, in Jesus' life, that he is um, helping the outcast, that he is healing the sick, that he is hanging out with the people that people didn't expect him to hang out with. Um, and he is deeply moved by human suffering. And he's so moved by it, he enters into human suffering, even into death himself, to rescue and bring us near to God. And something that I've been thinking about a little bit lately is just how, like, how much till the end he was compassionate and gracious towards his people. Like, he's literally on the cross, like, in the most pain that you can probably ever be in, and he's literally forgiving the criminal that is uh, on the cross next to him. And what a compassionate God, that he does not stop for a second to be compassionate and gracious, that even as he is dying, he is still um, showing compassion and showing love uh, to the people who uh, don't deserve it, really. And that's, um, the next word is all about grace. He's a gracious God. Um, and I don't think grace is something that I quite comprehend. I like it for myself. I like when people are gracious towards me. But I'm not so good at being gracious towards other people. So um, I work for a charity called Gobeth Morn. Um, and part of what I did, so for four years, we used to do a breakfast club. We can't do it now because of COVID. Um, and in our breakfast uh, club, we used to uh, make about 250 to 300 muffins on a Tuesday morning. So I'd wake up, um, I'd go into school for 7 a.m., I'd make 250 to 300 muffins. Um, and we'd have the kids come to breakfast club, and then we'd have the leftovers, we'd open it at break time so that men, so people can have muffins um, in the school. And another part of my job is that I teach, um, and when I teach, I'm kind of a visiting speaker. I don't really have any power in the classroom. The teacher does all of that for me. Um, and one, one, one year, um, we had this class on a Monday that was just a bit challenging. Um, there were some behaviors in it that were just quite hard to deal with, and they just used to drive me nuts, basically. Um, and the most, some of the class were really great, but there was just a few characters in there that I guess, yeah, the appropriate word is challenging, but if teachers are here, they will be able to read between the lines of what I really mean by that. Um, and, like, you could be in guarantee, so I would have this class on a Monday, and I'd be sitting in the office on a Tuesday morning with my 250 muffins, um, and you could guarantee that these, these kids would walk in 
and they would claim their free gift of a muffin. And everything within me wanted to say, you don't deserve that, give it back. You don't get a muffin because you, yesterday you did this. Um, and I had this, I had this thing where every time I just wanted to like withhold that blessing from them. I just didn't want them to have it. And I had God um, really have to like work on my heart and tell me that no, this is a free gift. This is, it doesn't matter if they deserve it or not, they are a free gift. And the way that I like to operate is a bit like Santa, really. Um, it's like I have a, a naughty and nice list. If you're on the nice list, you get, and if you're on the naughty list, you don't. And I've been realizing recently how unlike God's character that is, how and like how gracious God is um, in when we don't deserve stuff. And um, it, I, I realized in total I've, I've made about 20,000 muffins in my time. Only ate about 1,000 of them. Um, but I've actually, um, yeah, not been very gracious in my life. And I've committed more sins than I have made muffins in my life. And it says in the Bible that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And if you look at my small scale example of when I wanted to withhold because someone didn't deserve something, and then you look at my life and think of all of the things that I've done, all of the wrong that I've done towards God, all of the sin that I've committed, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, that God did not withhold from me literally the greatest gift, even though I didn't deserve it. Um, and I just think that's so amazing, isn't it? I just don't, I don't, I can't comprehend it because it's so good. God is so gracious, and He shows that through Jesus in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, but all the way through the book of Exodus, He is showing that He is being gracious to the people who have just um, committed a. a like has broken the first two commandments. He is just when he needs to be just, and we're going to look at that a bit next week, is he is a good God, and he has to have justice within that. But also, he is a gracious God, and he has shown that all through the Bible and all through the story of Exodus. And the next point is a slow to anger, um, which is, again, something that I'm not. But I've, um, when I was... In 2014, I went to South Africa, um, and we were teaching a, a class on identity, um, and we were just talking about how God made us, and how God doesn't make mistakes, and all that lovely stuff. And we had this one kid in my class, um, and she, she put her hand up, and I was doing it with two other volunteers, um, and she said to one of the other volunteers, who was called uh, Leanne, she said, Miss Leanne, why are you so short? And Leanne was like, because well, God made me this way. That was lovely. And then she turned to the next volunteer, who was called Tori, and she said, Miss Tori, why is your hair so curly? And she was like, because God made me this way. And then she looks at me, and I'm like, okay, what's coming up? Why is, why is my hair so golden? Why is my eyes so sparkly blue? What am I gonna get? And she says, Miss Amy, why is your nose so big? <laughs> I know, right? It's just awful. But what I didn't realize is that she actually had really good theology about God being slow to anger. She was trying to compliment me and tell me that I was slow to anger. Because the Hebrew word for long-suffering is actually, translated, is literally long of nose. So anger, uh, when, when we have anger, it shows in flared nostrils and snorting. Uh, like in enraged people, they have like redness of nose. So what it's saying is basically that it takes God so much longer for his wrath to kindle. So God's anger is really different from, from ours. So I actually showed in that moment that I was in fact not slow to anger, that I was very quick to anger if I was insulted. Um, but our anger usually revolves around us, isn't it? Like, well, I, I can only speak for myself, but it's because we've been insulted or we've been hurt by someone or we feel like we've been taken advantage of or someone has embarrassed us. Our anger revolves around our feelings. But God's anger is not like that. God's anger is linked to his compassion as a parent 
who loves their child and doesn't want to see them hurt. He knows the best way for our lives and he offers us a, a way to live differently. He doesn't get angry um, because he is a God, he doesn't get angry because he is a God of justice, but his baseline, no, he does get angry, sorry, read my notes wrong. He, so he does get angry eventually, it's slow to get into anger, anger, but he does get angry eventually, but because, um, yeah, he is a God of justice and he wants the best for our lives, but he also, his baseline is compassionate, gracious, and slow to anger. And then we've got these next words, abounding in love and faithfulness. So when we think of love, I don't know what you think of. Um, maybe you think of like a movie, of like that warm, fuzzy feeling of love that God like really likes us, and then um, you have that warm, fuzzy feeling towards someone. And it actually is true that you know God does love us in that way. Like He does look on us and smile, and just has a, a joyful uh, thoughts towards us. But it's so much more than that. Again, we link into that uh, compassion as a loving parent, a mother to a newborn baby, um, and all the feelings and all of the emotions that go with that. The love that's being described here can be translated as steadfast love unfailing love and covenant loyalty. So he repeats his character trait in, in verse 6 and 7 um, in the verses saying he is abounding in love and maintaining love to a thousand generations. So when something is repeated it's to prove a point that it's like he loves and he really loves, like God really loves us. And his love goes hand in hand with his faithfulness. So God's love is committed. It goes beyond feelings, it's commitment. He is all uh, the words for love that is described in Corinthians, you know, the verse that is about being patient and kind and all of that. He is like all of that um, love. He it goes beyond all feelings and into action as well. So faithfulness is something perhaps our culture is uh, not quite good at. We haven't got it down as well as God has. Um, and on average, people nowadays, we hold down a job for 4.2 years. An average uh, marriage in the US is uh, usually about 8.2 years. Um, and when I was actually Googling it, um, it said, one of the things that came up is like, how long does a first marriage last? And I was like, what do you mean, how long does a first marriage last? How many times do you plan to get married? Um, and it says um, the statistics for people who've been unfaithful um, to their partner in marriage is about 45% of men say that they've been unfaithful and 21% of women in the UK say that they've been unfaithful. So I think faithfulness is something that in our culture that we're missing. We're missing that commitment to someone through thick and thin, that loving and faithfulness. And that's what God shows. We can see in the book of Exodus and throughout the Bible that his faithfulness towards the people who are moaning and grumpy and the, uh, the faithfulness towards the people who are blatantly going against what he's literally just said. Oh, man, I just can't, but yeah, I just can't even begin to describe God's goodness and God's faithfulness and his love for you. And I just yeah, really encourage you to just explore it for yourself. See it throughout your life because it is there. And he is, we've seen those testimonies of God's faithfulness in finance, his faithfulness in provision and healing and all of that stuff, his faithfulness in community and prayer. He's so good. And we're not, are we? Well, I'm not anyway. I'm just going to talk for myself. But... I can be fickle and even sometimes actively go against what I know is the right thing to do. But God's faithfulness is so much more than mine. And fortunately for me, that God is faithful to me when I'm not faithful to him. So there's so much that uh, we can learn and we can get from, from this verse. Um, and I've only like the tip of the iceberg right now with, with what I'm saying. There's so much more to it. And there's so much more that um, I think... There's two ways that we can apply this to our life. The first one is, is this our picture of God? Is this what we believe about God? When we think of God, is this what comes up to our mind? Because this is God's character. And you may not feel like this matches up 
with your thoughts about God. You may feel like maybe God is angry at you, that he is punishing you, that he has no grace for you, or maybe you feel like you've been unloved or forgotten. Um, at times in my life, uh, I feel like perhaps this hasn't been my thoughts towards God. Um, last year, I went through a time of real difficulty and challenge, and it was probably the first time in my life that I really started to question these kind of characteristics of God. And I, my questions were kind of like, if God is like this, then why did I get ill? Why do I feel rejected? Why is this part of my life so hard? Why won't you take this pain away when I'm asking you to? But what I learned in that time, and what I think is one of the most important to, uh, things to learn for us, is that the Bible trumps your emotion. The Bible is above your emotions and your feelings. What the Word of God is, is the truth. This is absolute truth. That if, if this is not your experience of God, if this is not who you think God is, that it's probably an issue within ourselves. It's not an issue with God. Um, and I feel like when I was asking those questions and I was thinking those thoughts, that um, my view of God, I was looking at, my, uh, at God through the lens of my pain and my circumstances. It was because I was feeling hurt, um, and those feelings didn't come from God. It came from life and sometimes people and just the, the messes that we can get ourselves in as humans, but those deep feelings did not come from God. So the word of God trumps whatever our emotions and feelings tell us. This is the truth. This is the character of God. This is who he is, and he can't be anything but these things. So another challenge for us as well is how much are we like this? And this is where it gets really hard, because um, I, I wanna say like, the, it says uh, initially, the Lord, the Lord, and I, could I actually say Amy? Could I actually say Amy before these words and like illegit be true? So Amy, Amy is gracious and compa uh, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And I don't you know, I want to I wanna say that that is what I'm like, but I'm not like that um, all of the time. Um, Karis and Ash will tell you, if I get hungry, I'm definitely not these things. Um, but it's such a challenge for us. If we are to become like this God, then, then we need to be focusing on where in our lives am I showing compassion and grace and um, Am I being slow to anger? Am I showing love and faithfulness? And we can do that because we have this God who is that, who's supporting us. So it's really amazing. I think if we're going to reach this island and reach this country and change this world, that we're going to we're going to um, want to show these these things of God. That we want to show compassion. We want to be involved in social justice. We want to stand with those people who are hurting the outcasts. We want to be uh, gracious people, the people that give muffins to the people that don't deserve muffins, that turn up when everyone else doesn't turn up. We want to be slow to anger. We don't want to be having outbursts of anger and getting angry at people. We want to be slow. We want to be patient with people. We want to be in it for the long suffering um, and love and faithfulness. And I think one of the huge ways that... Um, that we can really show God's, um, God's work in our life is through, uh, through marriages and through, through our jobs and being faithful in those things, being committed in those things, because it really does make a difference. Um, we we uh, had, a, had a time as God by morn where we were working in one of the schools um, and uh, they had just had, um, oh, what are those things called when the, like, the authorities come in? Um, Esten. Yeah, like the Eston Eston people, right? And and the teachers were getting exhausted, um, and they were kind of like dropping like flies. And God by the morning, the unpaid staff members that we were there in the morning making muffins, we were there, we were committed to that school, and they actually noticed, they picked up on that. They were like, "Wow, you guys!" 
you're not even paid to be here and you're turning up um, because it was just the end of the year and it was so tiring for everyone. And it really does show when we start to live out these things, we show God's love to the people around us and it makes God attractive because people want this, people need this. Um, and God's made a way for, for this to happen through his people. So it's a huge challenge, this verse is a huge challenge for us. And I don't know if there's like a video that you've got going on the back, like the application. Yeah, there is. There is. Okay, so I'm just going to pray to close for us. Um, and then there's going to be a, a video application at the end of this. There's a worship song. Oh, it's a worship song. And yeah, just to think all over the, these things, those two questions of... Is this what I believe about God? Is this my thoughts towards God? And the next one is, how can I be more like these characteristics? So I'm going to pray to close, and then we'll, we'll have the worship song play. So Father God, we just thank you so much that you are a compassionate God, that you are a gracious God, that you are slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. We thank you that you showed this through the book of Exodus, through the way um, that you are so loving towards the Israelites. You're so faithful towards the, uh, the Israelites who are not faithful to you. And we thank you for Jesus who made, who's made a way for us to be in relationship with you. That free gift of eternal life that you offer, uh, even though we don't deserve it, you are so good to us, God. And we just thank you for um, the fact that you want to help us. You want to help us show this, this kind of uh, characteristics in our own lives, God. And as we seek to understand you more, I pray that we'll grow um, in, in all of these characteristics. That the Holy Spirit would come and work within our lives. That we will um, show your goodness and show your character to the people that we see. In Jesus' name, amen.